Okay, so we are not doing a Pirke Avos tonight. Actually, should we do? Hold on just a second. <laughs> Maybe we can tie it in. No, nah, it's going to be too ambitious. <laughs> I was going to do a last minute thing. Okay, we're not going to do Pirke Avos tonight. Uh, we're going to do a Chumash Exploration Shear. And this is a Chumash Exploration Shear because uh, I, let me moderate expectations here. Uh, it's going to be a different style than what we usually do. And I, uh, I, I mean, you'll definitely emerge with a new perspective. The question is like, will we get, you know, uh, specific ideas that's going to kind of be dependent on you. Okay. So let me actually start before saying what the style is going to be. Let me, let's just read the psukim that we're going to focus on tonight. Okay. We're going to do the first, almost the first Aliyah of Sefer Shemos. Okay. Um, and in fact, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it in English uh, for the overview. And then when we go into the individual psukim, we'll read them in Hebrew. All right. So I'm going to use the uh, all Torah translation from the Ibn Novetsky. Okay, beginning of Shemos, first 14 Pesukim. And these are the names of the sons of Yisrael who came to Egypt with Yaakov. Each man and his household came. Reuven, Shimon, Levi, and Yehuda. Yisachar, Zvulun, and Binyamin. Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the people who descended from Yaakov's loins were 70 people, but Yosef was in Egypt. Yosef died, and all his brothers, and that entire generation. The sons of Yisrael were fruitful, and swarmed, and multiplied, and grew very, very mighty. The land was filled with them. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Yosef. He said to his people, Behold, the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And when war occurs, they also join our enemies and fight against us and go up from the land. They set upon them... Uh, oh, hold on. I think there should be a quotation mark. Yeah, I think the quotation mark's in the wrong place. I think it should be here. Okay, they set upon them tax officers to oppress them in their burdens, and they built storage cities for Paro, Pitom, and Ramses. As they would oppress them, so would they multiply, and so would they spread out. They were filled with, with loathing because of the children of Israel. Egypt worked the children of Israel with backbreaking labor. They embittered their lives with hard work, with mortar and bricks, and with all work in the field. All their work, which they worked them, was with backbreaking labor. Okay, so um, those are the psukim we're going to deal with uh, today. And I'll just give the little... Uh, teaser okay based on the way that like i don't know a simple reading of the pasa of the psukim uh where did things begin to go bad would you say what pasuk yeah lauren or anybody looks like eight. Uh, sorry yeah eight okay i hear I an eight I, I thought i had muted sorry oh, okay Anyone else have a different answer? No. But yes. Yosef was in Egypt was weird. Uh, okay. Well, that that just means that um that because it says uh these are the sons of Israel who came to Egypt, but Yosef was already there. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think the way most of us read it is like one through seven is uh is like you know all the good stuff, and then the new king is when things started to go bad. Okay. So. What we're going to focus on tonight is Sforno's reading, which is radically different. All right. Uh, I don't know how many, I have no idea how many of you have heard this before. Uh, even if you've heard, um, it's possible you've heard it not in the name of Sforno, but, uh, but it's going to be, uh, it's going to be radically different. And this is going to be different than most of our shirim because usually our style is we take the text, we raise a bunch of questions, and then we answer them either ourselves or through different mafarshim. This is going to be like reading through and seeing Sforno's commentary and then discussing it as we go along. So the worst that can happen for this year, okay, is we just end up reading the Sforno's commentary. But what I'm hoping is as we read it, then you'll ask questions and then I'll give answers and then we'll have more questions and then we'll think and then it'll be like learning Sforno's commentary, okay? But this is not gonna be the normal style where we have like distinct questions and then like Mepharshman answers. It's gonna be like getting a perspective, all right? So th that's the expectations. Now, I am gonna mention a tool that you can use um, uh, if you want other perspectives. And uh, I know a lot of you know about this already, but if you go to Allah Torah, you go to see, uh, okay, I'm gonna use the Hebrew because that's how I use it. I guess you could do it in English also. Siddur and Haggadah, okay, or uh, yeah, Siddur and Haggadah. Inyanim, inyanim sorry, Iyunim Bahagada, studies in the Haggadah. You will get this nice, beautiful English. Um, first of all, you'll get a, a Allah Torah Seder companion, which you can print out um for your uh for your uh seder okay which has halachos and also has like uh, uh other stuff and i think they also have a 
Oh yeah, Seder. Okay, they, they have a lot of stuff. Okay, but anyway, what I, what you can look for here is it goes through all these topics. And for example, the topic we're going to be talking about is uh, purposes of the Egyptian bondage. Okay, so they have the overview where it goes through the questions. And then the key thing is approaches. Okay, so they have an overview, which you can read more. And then they have um, all the different, uh, the different um, uh, like categories of answers. Okay, so what was the purpose of the Egyptian bondage? So four main categories, punitive, uh, educative, uh, forging a national identity or no purpose. Okay, so let's say we wanted to go to educative. It'll say different things to spread monotheism, afflictions of love, a crucible, instill empathy for the less fortunate. And then you can click on the opening uh, it up and it will say for each of these things, who the target audience is, who, why was this foretold to Abraham? What is the relationship between bondage and exile? Historical parallels. It'll tell you which Mepharshim said it. And if you click on the Mepharsh, then the text will come up on the right side. So like, this is really everything you need to research on your own. Okay, so there's plenty of other answers. We're just doing the Swarmos tonight. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's one tool you can use. All right. And then the other thing I want to introduce you to, which I, I believe it's possible I mentioned this in a, uh, a women's share. I know I mentioned it with the with the guys, but um, what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, not just the regular Sforno commentary, but there is a, a new Sforno resource, which was released in February. Okay. And I'm going to read the email that released it to explain what it is. Okay. This is from Rabbi Novetsky's email on February 2nd. Okay. So he says, uh, Rabbi Avadia Sforno was a major Torah scholar and leader of the Italian Jewish community during the first half of the 16th century. His Torah commentary is well known and included in most standard Mikro Kodolo. Uh, as a biblical exegete, philosopher, and decisor of Jewish law, physician, mathematician, and more, Sforno was the embodiment of a Renaissance scholar. Now, what if we could travel back in time and experience what it was like to sit in Sforno's classes? And what if we could watch Sforno writing his commentaries, crossing out, refining, and adding material between the lines? Well, it turns out that we can indeed have something almost like both of these singular and exciting experiences, as well as the ability to study commentaries of Sforno, which were completely unknown until very recently. All of this is due to the survival of two unique manuscripts and the efforts of our friend Rabbi Moshe Kravitz. The first manuscript is an autograph, autograph meaning that he wrote it, Sforno wrote it himself, which includes Sforno's first draft of his Torah commentary with copious edits, as well as his commentaries on Yonah, Habakkuk, and Treasar, and his heretofore unknown commentary on half of Yeshayahu. The second manuscript, which is the one that we're going to be using a lot tonight, contains the notes from Sforno's lectures on Torah and Tehillim recorded by a student, uh, and I, I find this somewhat adorable, in the margins of a copy of the first printing of Rabag's Torah commentary, okay? He's, you know, I guess they didn't have paper, so he's like wrote it down in his in his Rabag commentary, you know, because obviously he's not writing in his Sforno commentary because Sforno's right in front of him, you know, telling the, giving the shear, okay, as well as a transcription of Sforno's previously unknown commentary on Rus. Over the last several years, Rabbi Moshe Kravitz has produced exquisite editions of the special contents of both of these manuscripts, and we are extremely fortunate that most of these annotated editions are now available in the Mikros Kodolos. Hard copies are also available. Uh, Rabbi Kravitz is a Gera Chassid and is currently completing his dissertation on the commentaries of the student of Sforno who took the notes, and he is also the newest member of the Altar team. We are truly excited to welcome him. Okay, so so it is, like, amazing to me because, um, again, I, I apologize if I, I've already said this to you guys, but, uh, you know, Let's say like last year, I gave a sheer, I gave a couple of shirim on the Sforno, uh, on the Korban Pesach and on uh, Sodom and Amora and on Bnei Israel uh, um, davening in uh, um, in Mitzrayim, and like I read through these Sforno commentaries and there were certain questions and certain answers, but then now I get these notes that a student was taking during the shear and it gives more detail and more explanation, like. And it's just amazing, you know, you don't think Sforno has been dead for hundreds of years. You don't think that there's gonna be new material released, but like, it's just like, it really is like finding like, you know, like a director's cut of something or or like a director's commentary. So that, that's what we're gonna to use tonight. Yeah, yeah. Do you know where they found these um, manuscripts all of a sudden? So I don't know, but typically these manuscripts have been available, but they've only been available in, let's say, like uh, Oxford University, and no one's published them. And that's typically what happens is that these things are there, and they're available, and they're just in the libraries, and uh, no one has like gone through and like read them and published them yet. So that's why there's always these new com new uh, new publications coming out. Uh, I don't think these were like discovered or anything like that. Um, uh, but I actually I don't know in particular. I'm just saying like the usual. Yeah, Lauren. 
Um, is the Sporno considered a, a Akhran or a Rishon? Good question. Okay. So there are two uh, two people. So the, the typical line where they draw the, the okay, the, the Tanaim and Amarim had a hard line. Okay. Like the, the you know, the, uh, the, um, the sages of the Mishnah are the Tanaim and then like the ceiling of the Gemara mark the Amarim. Rishonim and Akhram is a little bit less uh, clear and there's also no halakhic, real halakhic like um, uh, ramifications. People like to draw the line with Rav Yosef Cairo and what they say is that, you know, Rav Yosef Cairo wrote a commentary on the tour called the Beis Yosef and he wrote the Shulchan Arach and uh, people say, I, I think not jokingly, I think they say, treat the Beis Yosef as a Rishon and treat the Shulchan Arach as an Akhron. But the way I see it is it has to do more with um, their style of thinking or their style of writing. And in my book, then there are two people who are technically in the era of the Akronim, but are in the Rishonim club, okay? And that's the Sforno and the Abravanel, okay? Sforno thinks like a Rishon and writes like a Rishon. The Abravanel thinks like a Rishon and writes like an Akron. <laughs> and when I say thinks, I, obviously there are Akron who are brilliant. I mean, like, the way he analyzes stuff, like it seems, he seems to be doing the same type of thing that the Rishonim are doing. I can't really explain what that means, uh, but somehow in in in, in my uh, in my mind, like the Abravanel and the Sforno, I count them as Rishonim, even though they're technically like at the uh, uh, arguably in the era of the Achronim. So that's my answer. So I, I treat the Sforno as a Rishon. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. Okay, so let's read it through, and the way we're going to do this is we're going to do the um, Psukim the English, the Sforno, and then hopefully you have questions and observations about the Sforno, okay? But but the more discussion we have, the better, okay? But we're gonna, the goal is to form a picture of these events the way that the Sforno is depicting them, okay? And then emerge with a different view. Okay, so we have the first five Pesukim, okay? Which are in many ways the most neutral sounding. The Elish Mos B'nei Yisrael Haba'im Mitzrayim. These are the names of the children of Israel who came to Mitzrayim. Es Yaakov, Ishu Besu Ba'u. Uh, Yaakov, each man and his... Um, uh, household came, and then it lists the names. Reuben, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, Yisachar, Zvulun, and Vinamin, Dan, Venaftali, God, Vasher. Vahi, Kol, Nefesh, Yote, Yerach, Yaakov, Shivim, Nafesh. All of the souls who uh, came from the loins of Yaakov were 70. The Yosef, Hayab, and Mitzrayim. Okay, hold on. I just did the computer cleaning thing beforehand, but it feels it's feeling slow again. So I'm going to do it again, and uh, and uh, whether it's a police evil or not. So while I'm doing this, if you had to summarize, like, what's the point of these Pesukim, Okay. Uh, what would you say the point is? It seems like just information. Yeah, like information. Instagram. Okay, right. And like, if you had to guess at what the point of the information is, you know, given the fact that this is the beginning of the book of Shemos, what would you say the uh, the point of the information is? Yeah, Tamar? I don't know, but maybe like the makeup of the Jewish population. Okay, right. In other words, the whole uh, Shemos is going to be the... Uh, the story of B'nai Israel and Mitzrayim. So you have to say like, well, what was the makeup of the, what was the demographic there? Okay. Oh, see it's poor. I don't know why this is. Um, yeah. Okay. So that, that's, that would stand to reason. Okay. So Sforno is going to learn it not as a statement of facts and background, but as a narrative and as a judgment. Okay. So let's see what Sforno says. He says, hold on, I'm going to close this. Okay. He says like this. These people who are mentioned here were worthy of being mentioned by name. Each one was worthy of being considered as a man by his name that pointed to his, uh, his personal essence. Okay. So this is part of Sforno's theory, and he says this in many other places, but he says this in Shemos Lamed Ches Chaf Aleph, uh, when he's talking about names, he says, That I think he's talking about Betzalel and Aholiav who built the Mishkan, uh, and it uses the phrase Karasi Bashem that I call them by name. So when you're called by name, it means that you have distinguished yourself as an individual based on your own Selim Elohim, not just because you're a member of the species. Okay. So name, if you're being called by name, it means that you are worthy. You've like actualized your own potential as an individual. Okay. And then he says, back to regular Sforno on our Pasuk, these people for all of their life 
were luminaries. Okay, they illuminated the generation uh, and they guided them. And the generation did not go into literally into a bad culture. I mean, they didn't go uh, into a bad trend. Amnam, however, after they died, but after them, after their deaths, the tzaddikim in their children were not so chashuv, they were not so uh, significant in the eyes of God and man. So there were tzaddikim, but not to the point where they had distinguished themselves as unique individuals. Okay. Um, and uh, this is where we get the title of the shir. Uh, this is not my title, the title I announced on the uh, thing. So here are the Sworno's note, uh, the Sworno student's notes. Uh, and the student wrote, Tom Gullis Mitzrayim. So Amr HaGaon, the, the genius said, okay, I guess, you know, I guess that's how they took notes back then. And the genius said, Okay, and here's the phrase that 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 inspired me to give this year. Lahotzi mi liban shel omrim shel kadosh baruchu kiviyacho gazer galus mitraim chas v'shalom. Okay, that the whole reason why this whole passage is written is to remove from the hearts, like to like dispute the uh, to refute the the uh, the belief of the uh, people who say that God, as it were, decreed the galus mitraim, the exile of Egypt. God forbid. Okay, so. Again, here is another thing that I think if you ask most Jews, you know, why did we go uh, and get enslaved in Mitzrayim, they would say that God decreed it, okay? And where do you think the source is that they would say that God decreed it? Like, what, what do you think if you had to point to evidence that God decreed it? Yeah, Lauren? The Brisbane of Asarim. The Brisbane of Asarim, right? So, so we're going to go through a on that also. But let's just look at it right now um, just to get this. So Breshis, uh, I'm, I'm only going to read the text of the Brisbane of Basarim. Vayomer, uh, this is in Breshis 15, 13 through 16. Vayomer Allah Avram, God said to Avram, Yadoa teda, you shall surely know, ki ger yihi azaracha be'eris lo lahem, that your offspring will be strangers in a land that does not belong to them. Ba'avadum v'inu osam, and they, meaning in this land, will will uh, enslave them and afflict them Arba for 400 years. And also the nation that they uh, that enslaves them, I will judge. Um, oh, sorry, the, 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 the nation that they serve, I will judge. And afterwards, they will go out with great uh, wealth. The Ata and you, you will go, come to your, your fathers in peace. You will be buried in good old age. And the fourth generation will return here. Because the sin of the Emorites is not yet complete. So that sounds like God is telling Abraham that your offspring are going to, are going to be uh, enslaved. Okay, he doesn't say Egypt, but you'll be, they'll be enslaved. And it sounds like a decree. And I, I think that's what most people say. Okay, and again, you'll have many other opinions who say, that you know, God decreed uh, that the um, that the Jews go uh, and be enslaved in Mitzrayim. In fact, let me just show you this PowerPoint. Um, uh, this is a PowerPoint I used to use uh, in, when I taught this in uh, Shalhevet. Uh, two basic approaches to the Gullus Mitzrayim. One approach is it was necessary for um, Bnei Israel to be enslaved and oppressed in Mitzrayim in order to make them into a nation fit to receive the Torah. Approach two is what we're going to do. Uh, that it was not necessary, but as we're going to see, that it happened because of their sins. The best approach I, uh, that I've read for the first one is uh, not Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, but like Rabbi Yoni Sachs from, from Yeshiva. Um, so just to give you a sample of something that's not the Sworno's approach, that Rabbi Sachs says, in order to be ready to receive the Torah, B'nai Israel needed to fully accept Hashem as the one true God, but there was an obstacle. What is the obstacle? Is the old uh trap the god fantasy is that deep down they believed in another god man okay uh the god this is the god fantasy that the nachash tempted chava with deep down we believe that human beings could be gods and that deep, really deep down that i can be a god so according to rabbi Sachs, the experience of being enslaved and oppressed in its rhyme showed b'nai israel the evil that comes from the god fantasy because you literally had a paro who made himself into a god and you see what happens how delusional he can be and how he enslaves everyone else and how wicked of a society that's going to be. And then Rabbi Sachs's point is he says that the Makos shattered the illusion of the God fantasy and demonstrated that Hashem is the one true God and Paro is not the God and no other human being can be the God. And then that experience made them ready to receive the Torah to completely reject the society that deifies man. Okay. So that's like, a, that's like a, you know, an example of the common type of approach that God Put them into Mitzrayim. You know, Mitzrayim is called the crucible, purging them of their impurities, etc. But um, 
But Sforno's student, who presumably was recording his Rebbe's words, said, chas v'shalem, that God decreed the, uh, the, uh, the exodus, okay? Um, and you can kind of picture a Sforno student there, like, oh, Re <laughs> Rebbe said, chas v'shalem, that God decreed the exodus. I'm going to write that down, you know? Okay. But then he goes on and he gives the argument. Why? Ki hakel ya'ave... Uh, Oh, this is a rhetorical question from Eov. Ki hakel ya'aves mishpat, im shakai ya'aves tzedek. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert righteousness? So he's saying that it would be it would be uh, a uh, a injustice to take a nation and enslave them and torture them. You know, uh, even if it was for a good reason. I mean, this is for those of you who learn Eov with me. I mean, this is one of um, you know Bildad tries to argue to Eov. That oh God made you know uh, uh, destroyed all your wealth and killed all of your kids uh, to, to to in order so that you should perfect yourself and Eo's response is is like what kind of a God does that like just torture somebody in order to like make them uh, you know uh, give them some benefit like that's that's not a righteous God okay so that's the Sworn's opinion and he says Amar kihem hayu siba lazet they Bnei Israel were the cause of this. And it came from them. God only has one desire, so to speak, and that is to correct the iniquity of the Jews. So God is never going to torture them. He is going to try to help them. So the whole subjugation was their fault. Okay, that's the Sforno's premise here. Okay. Um, interrupt me at any time with questions and comments. Okay, because remember, I want this to be a discussion, not just a, 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 a lecture of reading Sforno. Okay. Lachain Amar, and therefore uh, he said, So this is repeating uh, Sforno's point that um, this is why the Psukim say that the only people who were worthy were the ones who were called to be called by name that indicates their essence is these 12, uh, 13 people. Ruvin, Shimon, etc. Vahashivim Nefesh and the 70. Okay, so it's a good reading here, which is there were 13 people who were worthy of being called by name because they were tzaddikim. And then the 70 people, their only worthiness came from the fact that they were offspring of Yaakov. So they had like zuchus avos from Yaakov, but they were not worthy to be called by name. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, right. Okay. So that is the first part. Okay. Any, any uh, questions or comments on this so far? Okay, next. Oh, and by the way, this is not just, oh yeah, all right, all right, not yet. Okay, all right. So then we get to this, these psukim, three psukim here, six through eight. Yosef died and uh, all of his brothers and all that generation. Uh, and B'nai Israel were fruitful, swarmed, uh, multiplied, and became very, very strong. And the earth uh, became filled with them. The land became filled with them. The Yakam Melchadash Amitraim Shalu Yada as Yosef. And a king arose, a new king arose over Mitraim who did not know Yosef. Okay, now, Pasuk Vav, Yosef and all of his brothers and all that generation died. Plain shot is it's saying, you know, this is a time skip. Okay. Um, but what does Sforno say? Koshivim Nefesh, all the 70 people. Shalo Bahador Lakilko Gamor Koyamehem. Okay. That the generation did not come to uh, corruption as long as they were alive, and in fact, there's a midrash that supports the Sforno that says, "V'yamas Yosef v'chol echav v'chol dorahu." This is Shmos Rabba one eight. Lalamedcha. This is to teach you. Shekol zman shaya echad mehem kayam miosan shiardu mitzrayim lo shibdu hamitzrayim biyisrael. That as long as one of those seventy remained alive, then Egypt did not subjugate Israel. Okay, so again, it's tying it to the fact that they were still righteous people. But then once those people died, then everyone everything went bad. Okay. Now, Puzzle Zion, yeah, yeah. L. Um, does for now address, I mean, like, why wouldn't it say the the brothers' names instead of just Vikholakhav if they were mentioned before? Uh you mean why sing uh, Yosef and not mention the uh Yeah. The, you know, it's it's a good question. <clears throat> I, I'm tempted to say that that really this is all um uh this is overlapping the end of Bracius and the end of Bracius, it does describe Yosef dying. So, uh, but it has not yet said that the brothers died, I don't think. So I think it's just like a, a recap. It's a good question. I, I don't know. I don't know why I would only say Yosef. Um, yeah. Or maybe he would say, 
that along with this theory that you know that Yosef is, you know merits being singled out by name even more that somehow like once Yosef died then maybe it affected his brothers in a way that made them no longer be called by name I I'm not sure um, uh, or the simple answer I feel like Matsuda's David would give this answer if Matsuda's David were on Torah that uh, you know once you have a whole list of names that begins with uh, um, oh I guess it didn't begin with Yosef. Never mind. That scratch that answer. <laughs> yeah, good question. I don't know. Yeah, Pega. Um, wasn't Yocheved one of the seventy? Uh, yeah. Um, but I assume Yocheved is dead already. Also, or are you um, asking why she's not mentioned? I mean, but she but she was like around for Moshe, obviously. So then, like, she was she was alive. So I'm just wondering how that fits in. You mean why there, why Yocheved is not mentioned as one of the people singled out by name as in if it was if it um if the slavery only started after all of the 70 died um but like Yochavid was still a lot like I'm well, just wasn't alive when Moshe I don't think Yochavid was alive when Moshe was um was redeeming the Jews That'd but be, there is uh yeah. there's like that midrash that um like Yochavid and Amram divorced because of the um, because of the slavery and because of it, like not necessarily sl the slavery I mean the oh, oh you mean from the beginning of it yeah yeah I mean there's different midrashic timelines I mean you know it's a question also of how <laughs> how old Yochever was in general yeah I mean you know generally speaking by the way Sforno is a is more in the Pshat camp than in the midrash camp he'll bring midrash when they support the Pshat but he's not a uh, not typically a midrash guy so so, you know, and, and we have a rule, we don't bring proofs from Midrashim. So like, I don't, I don't I, that, it's a good question what the Midrashim mean, but I, it's not a, uh, it's not something Sforno is gonna have to take into account. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now we get to, yeah, Lauren. But just, just to follow up, so is, is, is Yocheved being considered part of the 70 a Midrash? Not so that's what I thought Vega was asking. So it's funny, because Yocheved and Amram have good reputations, right? That they're, right. No. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. So I guess I'm wondering, like, because I guess her question was like, if Yochavit's part of the seventy, then how could he say that they all died? Right. Because the slavery had to have been alive. But I guess right. you're saying that's so, so. Here's the other thing, though. Right. Is uh, on the one hand, you can argue that that Yochavit is uh, is righteous, and that maybe she should be mentioned by name, right? But here's the thing: in with Sforno's premise, okay, that uh, you know that these people are mentioned by name if they're righteous. What argument can you bring? I, and this sounds heretical, okay? But what argument can you bring that Yocheved was not righteous and Amram was not righteous? I know Chazal say they're righteous, right? But that's in the Midrash. What argument can you bring from the Psukim that, that Yocheved and Amram were not righteous? It calls them in Perak Bet, like that gateway ish. Yeah. It Davka does not name them. Vayelech ish mi base levi, vayikach as bas levi, right? Like, like and, and again, in English, you got to appreciate the, 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 the from a literary perspective. Some guy, some Levite married some Levite woman, right? That's how we would say it. Now, if these people are important, you would mention them by name, you know? So again, I, obviously I know that, that in the Midrashim, then they're righteous. And then don't they say that Amram was one of the people who never sinned? Or am I thinking of Yishai? I, I forgot. They say Amram was like very, very righteous, you know? But, but yeah, uh, and you can see Sforno doesn't mention anything about, um, about Amram and Yochevit here. Uh, does the student say anything? Nope. Okay, yeah. Yeah, in, in, good, good questions though. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting. And then also there's the list later on where it does mention Yochavid. So I don't know how Sforno reconciles that. Okay, all right, good questions. Uh, I don't know the answers. Okay, now we get to this very interesting Pasuk. Okay, Pasuk Zion. The, uh, the children of Israel were fruitful and swarmed, multiplied and grew very, very mighty. And the land was filled with them. Now, plain shot, what is that saying? Yeah, Tamar? They had a lot of kids. They had a lot of kids. Okay, now what's the one uh, verb there that is a little weird? Vayishvatsu. Uh, Vayishvatsu, right? So, uh, so it's strange. They swarmed, okay? Because normally you use that by uh, about insects. Now, does anyone know the uh, Rashi's interpretation of why it uses this weird term? Because, of course, Rashi is going to comment on it. Is this the six kids at yeah, one time? Yeah, exactly. So Rashi on the spot says Vayishvatsu. Um that exactly like Ayala said oh, too far. But you should shisha shisha bekeras achad. They had six at a time, six kids at a time. Okay, like just like insects, they multiply with you know I don't know many at a time. Okay, but what does Sforno say? 
Paru v'yishutu, they were fruitful and swarmed. V'achar shemesu kol shivim nefesh, after all 70 souls died, natu ladarche shratim. They went to the ways of, of creepy, crawly, disgusting creatures. Okay, and then he, he, he has a pun. They went to the darche shratim, she ratzim er shachas, that they ran to hell. Okay, um, so, so he... Uh, so he's saying that that Yishutu is alluding to the fact that they acted like uh, disgusting creatures, okay? Uvachain, and therefore, now this is another famous question, right? So Viakam Melech Hadash Al Mitzrayim Shor Lo Yada As Yosef. So a new king arose over Egypt that didn't know Yosef. What 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 are the what's the famous Machlokas? Two ways to interpret this. Yeah, Tamar. Uh, I think like either it was literally a new king or it was the same king, but I don't know. He had a new attitude. Yeah, exactly. So Rashi says, Yakam el Khadash, Ravu Shmuel, Khad Amar Khadash Mamish. One says it was literally a new king, Vahad Amar Shinishad Shukazirosov. The other one said his decrees were renewed, like he had a new policy, okay, like a new regime. All right. Um, Sforno says it was the same king. Okay, but then what's the problem if you say it was the same king? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, sorry, uh, just one second. Sforno, yeah, Sforno says it was the same king, but now what, yeah, what is the problem though? With the shot, if you say that it was a, it was the same king. Yeah, Ayala. Would it be weird that he doesn't know Yosef? It'd be weird that he doesn't know Yosef, right? Okay, why would that be weird? Because Yosef was like just recently around. Okay, he was recently around, but more than just the fact that he was like a recent uh, in the news. Yeah, Vanessa. He was like the head of everything besides. Yeah, power. he was second in power, and he saved Egypt, right? Okay, so check out this. This is a very creative interpretation. Okay, that's why I, one of the reasons I love Sporno. He's concise, he's, he has ideas, and he's creative. Even though there was a memory of him in the Chronicles, meaning, I mean, the history books talked about him, Lamalachim of the kings, Belisafik, without a doubt, especially because of the fifth uh, that was placed as a law. Now, if you look at Breshi's 4726, um, it even says, so not just that he was famous. And uh, and second in command has saved Egypt, but it also says, "Vayasim osa Yosef lechok ad hayom hazeh," that Yosef made a, uh, a a tax until this day, meaning until I guess the time of the Chumash, al admas mitraim on the land of Egypt lefar lechomish um, that the tax like twenty percent. Okay, so this was a law on the books, and they probably called it like Yosef's tax, okay, or something like that, right? So even though they knew him, so here, here's this beautiful interpretation. Lo alsa alev hamelach The king could not conceive of the fact that Yosef belonged to that people. am ze roy panim baburo, such that he should favor this people on account of Yosef. In other words, there was such a disconnect between uh, the 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 disgusting behavior of the Jews and the exalted Yosef that the king's like, this can't be the same people, okay? And I was trying to think of an analogy that, um, that captures this. And if someone knows history better than I, I know just enough history to convince myself that this is a good analogy, uh, but it could be like, it could have some big hole in it. Okay, so, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong or if you come up with a better analogy. If you go to a, uh, a woke teenager today, okay? And you ask them, now, I don't know if Abraham Lincoln has been canceled yet, okay? But I think last I checked, then we like the fact that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. I know people will say that he did it for different reasons, okay? But if you ask, like, if you took a survey and you said, like, which party uh, did, uh, did Abraham Lincoln belong to, then I think, like, most, like, average teenagers would say, oh, of course he was a Democrat, right? You know? But Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. And not only was he a Republican, but the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln's day was was the anti-slavery party and the Democrats in the South were the pro-slavery party, right? And it didn't flip until like, like uh, the, you know, until uh, I think the um, civil rights movement, all right? So, so you can imagine someone who uh, like venerated uh, Abraham Lincoln saying, what, he was a Republican? The Republicans today have nothing to do with Abraham Lincoln. And in fact, many people do say that, and it's, it probably is true, right? You know, but that's like the way that 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 uh, it's saying a new king who arose. He he admired Yosef, and Yosef was this man of God, and like he saved Egypt, and like these these Jews 
don't tell me that that guy was Jewish. Or another analogy might be that I'm sure that there are Christians who have a certain amount of cognitive dissonance that they are anti-Semitic, but they know that Jesus was a Jew and they just cannot in their mind say that, that the people that these, these, uh, you know, uh, greedy, uh, 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 horned, well poisoning, you know, protocols of the elders of Zion people going around are the same, uh, you know, nationality as their Lord and Savior, you know, so like, like it's some sort of like disconnect. Yeah, Vanessa. Uh, yeah, that I get. that's that I get great. Yeah. Why would it then say a new king rose over? Like, what's this for those explanation for like calling him a new king? If it's that's same? a good question. That is like, good. I don't, don't get how that piece fits in. Right. So, so he does say, by the way, he does say, I, I, I made him, uh, I, I think I made a mistake. I kept on something with short circuit in my brain when I said this. He does say he is a new king. Okay. Uh, so fra factually, he's a new king. Okay. But he's taking as two separate things. He's a new king and he didn't know Yosef in terms of, of like cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance, exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. I just, I, yeah, my Hebrew's not great. I, 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 I lost the new king piece. Great. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah All yeah, my yeah, questions yeah. are answered. Okay, good. All right. And then the sheer, uh, the, I'm just going to read the, the student's notes now, calling Yayala. So that generation, those people were fit and they were tzadikim. So he says like this. So in the, in the Sforno's notes, see, this is the type of thing that you need the student's notes for, right? You see, in the Sforno's commentary, he put, they were fruitful, um, and uh, and and they were swarmed, but then he only comments on the swarming. Okay, but apparently in Sheer, the Sworno said they were fruitful like creepy crawly creatures without any uh, civilization. Okay, which uh, and they acted like shratim. Um, uh, in a manner that led them to be to multiply and fill the earth with them. All of this is degradation. So here we get further clarity in the students' notes that I'm trying to think of, of an example of this that is not like insulting to a certain people, but I feel like there are minority populations that um, I don't know nowadays if people if there are minority populations in America where people say this. I you know you know people do th say this with like. Uh, uh, I think with um, with like Mexican immigrants, right? They'll say that they they come to our country and like they just multiply, but they say it in a way that like degrades the society. Or like like I'm sure they said this about uh, about um, uh, Roma or as they used to be called gypsies, right? That they they are just these like poor, dirty people who go around and just like you know they breed. They use the they'll use the word breed, right? You know, so so. Sworno student is saying that the Sworno characterized the Shratim as not just that that term is negative, but the entire thing is negative. They all they did was just sit there and just like breed like Shratim, you know, uh, like and and that's like a negative thing. Okay, yeah, Ayala, what were you gonna say or ask? Um, I'm not sure if it's such a question. It's weird to me that it says Asher Loya Da Yosef, like that language. I feel like it's strange, but I don't know if that's a fair question because okay. I guess anyone would have to deal with that. Yeah, right. I mean, it is a fair question, even though everyone has to deal with that. Uh, but, uh, but, but his, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the thing that is a little bit of a stretch, according to him, is it's not that he didn't know Yosef, it's that he didn't accept the connection between Yosef and the, his offspring, you know? So it, it, you, you do have to, like, cram that into the words a little bit, you know? Uh, but yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so then, yeah, Vanessa. I don't know if this, like, resolves it, but, like, you didn't know Yosef. Like, you didn't know the actual Yosef. He had this idealized Yosef in his head that was, like, this oh, great that's grand viceroy who, like, saved Egypt. Okay, right. So, so they, like, yeah. actual literal people he knows as Jews that are, like... <laughs> that's that exists, right. Right. I mean, you know, that's a, a, a good read on Lo Yada as Yosef, but I don't know if it fits into his shot because, according to his shot, it's not really Yosef's fault that the people went so far. So it, the problem is not the idealizing of Yosef. The problem is the, like, I mean, the, the judgment of his offspring, but it sounds like it's, we could get a clear picture that the offspring were, were pretty bad. So, so I, I, I like, in isolation, I like to read, but I don't know if it fits in with his, uh, what he's saying, but a uh, good, good attempt though. Okay, now, 
Um, you might be wondering, where's the Sworn get all this from? Okay, like, is he just making this up? You know, is he just reading into the Shrachim? So there are Psukim in Nach that indicate this. And one of the set of the Psukim is um, uh, in Tehillim, 105, 23 through 25. Now, if you ever want to learn, I don't know if you ever feel this way about um, uh, an area of learning where you're like, okay, I feel like I am, I've seen this so many times that I need a new angle. So I've always wanted to do this new angle. Tehillim 105 tells the whole story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim and the Midbar, but it's through Tehillim. Okay, so if you want like a new approach to the story, you can do it there. And it has a bunch of weird stuff like the plagues are in a different order, you know, so it's interesting. So it says, Vayavo Yisrael Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim, Vayakov Garb Eretz Cham. Thus Israel came to Egypt and Yaakov sojourned in the land of Cham. Vayafer, Vayafer es Amo Ma'od. And he, God, made his nation uh, exceedingly fruitful. And made it mightier than its oppressors. He turned their hearts to hate his nation, uh, to plot against his servants. So Sforno here says, so again, he reads into this his negative judgment. So he, he, uh, he entered Egypt, the Jewish people entered the, uh, the Egypt as Yisrael. Shorer im Elokim v'Iman Hashem, who wrestles with God and with man. That's like Yisrael. That was the name that Yaakov was given uh, for his like greatness of like uh, that he reached uh, with wrestling with God and with man. Okay, but Yaakov garb Eretz Ham, but Yaakov is the one who sojourned in the land of Ham. Amnam Zaro Achrav Nepach Lager v'Shafel be'Eretz Ham v'Darche Knaanu Mitzrayim. Okay, so he's saying. That the Pasuk is really, see, you read the Pasuk and it sounds like just it's saying the same thing in two different ways. But he's saying, no, no, no. When Israel came to Egypt, he was Yisrael. That's like the distinguished name. But then he became Yaakov, which is like the, before he became Yisrael. Gar, he sojourned, which is a lowly term, right? Being like a ger, like a stranger. And land of Ham, Ham was the um, father of Canaan. Uh, and Mitzrayim, which is the degraded guy, he's the one who castrated and raped his father. So he's saying, Amnam Zehu Achra, Zaro Achra, his offspring after him, Nepak Lager, he transformed into a Ger, Vishafel, Be'eretz Ham in the land of Ham, Bedarche Kanan Mitzrayim, in the ways of Kanan Mitzrayim. So he's, again, he's reading into this that they were, um, they were bad, okay? And he turned their hearts to hate his nation. So God caused the Egyptians to hate his people. Osam Shalo Abdu Avodazara. Um, oh, actually, you know what? we got to read this one in. Um, we got to read this one in the the psukim. Hold on, I don't even know if I need this here. Um, oh yeah, uh, yeah. So you see again here the notes of the sworn student says also shayu mixasim osi maise ham avi kanan shaya Russia. Some of them were doing the actions of Ham, who was the father of Kanan, who was a Russia. Some of them were intelligent. Okay, and they did not do work, Kamo Shevet Levi, right? So we know this from the Masorah that Shevet Levi uh, never got enslaved and they maintained the, uh, the ways of Abraham. And they learned the abominations of, uh, of, uh, of Mitzrayim. Okay, let's see if there's anything else here. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, all right, so now, okay, so now let's go to, yeah, tomorrow. Um, I just think it's interesting that he kind of dropped in passing that the way that Levy was uh, enslaved was that they were like masculine, like they yes. well they like figured out how to not get enslaved. Like I don't know, it's ah, interesting. Okay, good question, right? So what is the masculine? So I was going to save this, but might as well read it now. So um, Rambam. Oh, actually, you know, what? let me let me ask this question. Okay, what was their main sin in Mitzrayim? The Jews, if you're gonna say that they sent him in, I mean, they, they did send him in trying, but Sworn was gonna say that they really went bad. What was their sin? Yeah, Lauren, was it a vote of Zara? It was a vote of Zara. Okay, now if I ask you how you know that, what would you say? There's several I'm answers. I'm not sure. I think, okay, yeah, yeah, Ella, maybe Carbon Pesach was like ah, removing okay. them from that. So that was what I was gonna say. Carbon Pesach shows that the main thing that would need, need to happen to differentiate them from uh. Uh, from the Egyptians was rejecting the Egyptian of Ozara. Okay. Um, so that's definitely a possibility. 
Um, there's another source, which we know from Torah Shabbat Peh from the Rambam. Okay, so he, this is in Perak Aleph of Avodah where he goes through the history of Avodah So, you know, uh, okay, the quick history. Uh, Enosh and his generation worshipped uh, created beings because they thought that that was God's will. Then eventually people made statues and said that that's God's will. And then they eventually said that the, the uh, you know, the uh, celestial bodies are prophesying to them and eventually they forgot God and they just worshiped these things. Then Avram Yavim came along, he discovered, rediscovered Hashem, broke the idols, went to debate, got a bunch of followers, uh, started uh, his people and, uh, you know, uh, set up a Masorah and things got better and better and better. Achi Gila Eretz Kanan Okay, that's not it. And then there became a nation that, uh, uh, they set up a Masora. Yeah. Yaakov Avina Limit, Banav Kulam. Yaakov taught all of his kids, but he did Levi Winahu Rosh. He separated Levi and made him into the Rosh Yeshiva. Hoshiva Yeshiva Lulame Der Hashem, Velishmur Mitzvos Abraham. He uh, set up, again, not a literal Yeshiva building, but like a uh, learning institution to teach the way of Hashem and to keep the Mitzvos of Abraham. But Tiva Banav, as Banav Shalom, Yafsiku Mibne Levi Mamuna Achar Mamuna. He commanded his children to not let the appointment cease from Shevet Levi. Uh, so that the learning will not be forgotten. This thing, uh, this matter grew in strength with Yaakov and the people who uh, 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 attached themselves to him. There became a nation that knew God. Until the Jews spent a lot of time in Egypt. And they went back to worship, uh, to learn their ways, and to worship what Zara like them. Except for Shevet Levi, the mitzvah's avos, that stood by the mitzvah of the avos. And Shevet Levi never worshipped the Vodazara. It was just like a, a small portion. And the root that Avram planted was uprooted. And the children of Yaakov returned to the error of the of the nations and their straying. Uh, and then um, God made Moshe Rabbeinu. So I think, I don't know if the Sporno agrees with the Rambam necessarily, but my guess is the Maskilim does not mean that they were like smart and they figured it out, but they remained knowledgeable about all the ideas that Avram taught them. Uh, and they kept that alive. Um, so that, that's what I would say. Um, they, they comprehended. Okay, now. Wait, can I ask? Yeah, sure. So you're saying they were masculine in terms of, let's say, like philosophy and Derek Chaim or something, and that, does right. that is that causally related to them not having a Vodas Parv? Uh, yes, that, that the only, we're going to see in a little while that, um, that there's a correlation between the, the sin of Avodah Zara and then becoming enslaved. Okay. Um, and they were immune to that. But if you remind me when we go through the, how they were enslaved, we'll, we can try to explain Shevet Levi. Okay, okay, cool. Thanks. Now, the biggest proof, though, that the, big, that the problem of the Jews was of Zara, bigger than um, the Korban Pesach, because you could argue that the sin that caused them to be enslaved was not of Zara, but by the time they were assimilated, then they were still attached, they were attached to Vodazara. And a bigger proof than the Rambam, okay, because you know the Rambam is not getting this from the, the Psukim and the Chumash, is this obscure uh Nevo in Yechezkel, okay, which is the Sforno's big, big, big uh basis. So I'm just gonna read this in English because it's easier. Uh Yechezkel 25 through 10. Say to them, thus said Hashem, the Lord Hashem Elohim. On the day I chose Israel, I raised my hand in oath for the seed of the house of Jacob and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt. I raised my hand for them, saying, I am Hashem, your God. On that day, I raised my hand for them, swearing to take them out from the land of Egypt to the land that I sought out for them, a land that flows with milk and honey, a splendor for all the lands. And I said to them, every man, uh, let's highlight this, cast away the detestable idols of his eyes and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am Hashem, your God. Okay, so that was God's warning. But they rebelled against me and did not want to listen to me. No man cast away the detestable idols of their eyes, and they did not forsake the idols of Egypt. So I had thought to put out my wrath, pour out my wrath upon them, to spend my anger on them in the midst of the land of Egypt. So this is a, an astonishing thing. God is saying, I was going to destroy them in Egypt. Okay, but classic, what stops God from doing that? But I acted for the sake of my name, that it not be desecrated in the eyes of the nations in whose midst they were, before whose eyes I made myself known to them, promising them to take them out of the land of Egypt. So I took them out from the land of Egypt and brought them to the wilderness. So th these psukim from Nevuah say that the main hate of the Jewish people in Mitzrayim 
was uh, was a Vodazara. Okay, so that's like this Forno's big uh, proof, which he's going to quote that puzzle in a little while. Okay, so now we get to the enslavement. Viomer Elamo, Hine Ambene Israel Rava Tumimeno, behold the people. Uh, so he said to his nation, Paro said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are more and mightier than we. Um, Hava Nishak Malo, come, let us outsmart him. Pen Yerbe, lest he become um, uh, numerous. Vahayaki Sikrena Milchama, and it will be that when he. Um, declares war, sorry, when, when war is declared, um, uh, they will also join our enemies, and they will fight with us, and they will go up from the land, and they will go up from the land, okay? So, Sforno says this, okay? Let us outsmart him, to deal with him deceptively, okay? Um, so, okay, here's the thing. I, I don't know, do you know what the common, what, what, what's the common understanding about why they enslaved B'nai, why Egypt enslaved B'nai Israel. Well, what would you say? I, I kind of am too in Swarno world. Yeah, Ayala? I think so. They could like stop reproducing and stop becoming okay, powerful. Right. right. Okay, good. That's definitely true. Yeah, Vanessa or uh, Lauren? So that they don't like overtake them, like typical, like, oh, the Jews are going right. to grow and take over and like. Right. Keep them under control. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, good. Lauren, yeah, same thing. Okay. Um, oh, I, I, I was going to say, I don't know if this is Rashi, but doesn't yeah. he talk about like there being like a foreign enemy coming and they would maybe join them if they fought against them? Oh, so we have to um, uh, enslave them so that they don't join the enemy, right? Okay, so that yeah. is what Rashi was talking Okay, now check out what Sforno does. And I actually did not notice this until I, I was just double checking in the English. The English uh, Rabbi Pelkovitz points out, the Psukim say like this, Okay, uh, let us outsmart them. Pen your bear, lest they uh, multiply. Um, and then the Alamin Haaretz is at the very end. But look what Sforno does. He, re he reverses the Debra Hamaskils. Havan is Kakmalo, the Alamin Haaretz, and Pen your bear. Okay, so, so if you read it this way, the Alamin Haaretz, me atmo, they will go up from the land on their own. Me blishin nagarshin bekoach bilti siba mavueras. Okay, so according to Sforno, the Mitzrim wanted to find a way to get the Jews out of the land. Okay. So they actually wanted not to control the Jews and keep them in the land, but to get them out of the land. Okay. And one of the reasons why they wanted to do that is because of the war thing. Okay. Uh, sorry. He says, um, I forgot what that, that's an idiom. Uh, let me just check the English again. By the way, just in terms of other Sforno resources, the two resources I use most are the Palkovitz uh, translation, but then the, let me just cut the other one also. If you love Sforno, so then the Rav Cooperman Sforno with the extensive, extensive, extensive footnotes is the best Sforno resource ever. Um, I just love it and love it and love it. Uh, yeah, Tamar. Can I ask a question about this reading of Sporn, like uh, how Sporn was reading the Pasuk? Uh, not yet. Okay. Okay. I just want to finish reading it first. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, they will. Uh, da, 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 yeah. Uh, oh, so. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So um, they will go up out of the land by themselves. Me blishin agarshin bakoach without us forcing them out. Without uh, a clear cause, which would make us, uh, the Republic says, for this course would cause us to be a derision among our enemies. So, in other words, their goal is to get the Jews out of the land. Okay. But if they, in, they had to do it cunningly, because if they, if they just like did some crazy thing, let's say like they pulled a Haman, but instead of saying like, um, Let's say they pulled a Spain, okay, and said, we're just going to kick out all the Jews, then other nations will look down at them, okay? So they had to do it in a crafty way. And the reason why they wanted to get them out is, uh, because they will multiply, if they continue to multiply, then when war is called out, when some war happens, when some war happens, 
Nefesh David. Okay, fine. Venosof gam hu also nene. Then they'll join our enemies. Ki biyosam nivdali mimeno bimila uvalashem ubadeos ha'ivrim. Since they are already differentiated from us in bris mila, in language, and in the Jewish opinions, Jewish ideas. Be'ofen shelo yuchlin ha'mitzrim lecho as ha'ivrim lechem. You see in Yosef's time, it already said that the... Uh, Egyptians did not want to eat with the Hebrews, okay, because uh, of their different customs. Then they will be enemies with us without a doubt. And um, in Yosef's time, um, their hatred will be revealed uh, when there's war. So in other words, like this. According to Sworno, they want to get the Jews out, but they have to do it craftily so that they don't arouse the uh they don't get derided in the eyes of the other people and the concern is if the jews stay here they'll continue to repopulate to populate and then when there's a war then they'll join our enemies and uh and that'll be bad for us because they're already different from us they're not going to identify with us because we are already separate okay yeah tomorrow you have a question yeah i just wanted to understand how sforno is reading the pasuk so um wait could you scroll back up for a second is he saying the pasuk like 10 is saying let's deal wisely with them because of xyz and they should go up from the land like is that how he's reading that word um is this I, like not part of the less i guess yeah so i think this is what he's saying hold on i think if you go like that come let's deal wisely with, with them and then like parenthetically um uh, lest they multiply, and when war occurs, they will join armies and, and rise against us. And and therefore, therefore, we must make them go up from the land. That's how he's saying it. And cool. this is Thank very you. different yeah. from Rashi because uh, also, just if you know Rashi, Rashi says that this last part uh, he brings on the possibility that this is a euphemism that it really means that that the Egyptians were concerned that the Jews are going to drive them up from the land. But Sworn saying, no, 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 they, we want to make them go up from the land. And Allah in art, it fits in really well because Allah means they will go up from the land and that's what he wants them to do. He wants them to go up on their own. Yeah, yeah. So how would he interpret all the times that Paro refuses them to leave? Ah, he's going to get to that in a few psukim, okay? Because things changed in a little while. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right, so let's see now what happens. Actually, there's, I don't think there's any... Oh, yeah, see, this is another good uh, point. Okay, so, okay, he, just adding to this. This is to teach that after the um, death of that generation, they were they did not pay so much attention to the good. Oh, you know what? It could be that this mushgachi means they they didn't have God's hashgacha, and that's what allowed the new king to rise. That actually makes a lot more sense. In other words, the tzaddikim in the nation uh, carried enough of the hashgacha that God was preventing this new political situation from changing. But then as a result of the withdrawal of hashgacha, because of the people who were not tzaddikim anymore, then that's what allowed the new king to rise up. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so here he clarifies, also, have any lo. Let us outsmart them. And through outsmarting them, they will go up from the land. Meaning that's the desire. And the reasoning is lest they uh, they wage war, etc. Okay, so now what's with the slavery? Okay, because now it doesn't make sense. Not Before Yael's question about like, you know, uh, Paro is, um, what do you call, uh, you know, wants to keep them. But even before that, if you, if you Egyptians, if the Egyptians want the Jews to leave, why would they enslave them? Okay. Yeah, Ayala. Um, so wait a sec. I just completely forgot my question. Okay, I guess I'll Okay, sure. Okay, so now we get Vayasimu Allah Sare Misim Laman Ano Sobisivosan. They placed on them tax masters or tax officers uh, to oppress them with their burdens. Vayivin Ari Miskanos Lafaro as Pisom Ves Ramses. And they built storage cities for Paro, Pisom and Ramses. Okay. So here's how the Sforno explains it, okay? Uh, oh, hold on. I thought he explained it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, he does. Okay. Laman, oh. Yeah, Laman Anoso Bisivlosam. So he says like this. Laman Anoso, Kedeshi Askimu Latseis El Eretz In 
so that they would make the decision to go to another land. Okay, so let me let me just supplement this with, with my explanation here. So, so what happened? So the Egyptians wanted the Jews to leave. So what they do is they placed taxes on them, okay, and said, oh, if we tax them enough, then they're, no, they're not going to want to live here, okay? And that would be good reasoning, okay? Um, uh, because most people, if the taxes are too high, then they're going to move elsewhere, just like all the, you know, multi, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, people who are billionaires in California move into another state because they don't want to get taxed that much, okay? But what happened? Vayiven are miskinos, uh, and they built stored cities. So again, clever reading here. Who is the subject of Vayasimu Alav? It's Egypt. The Egyptians put upon the Jews tax masters. But then Vayiven, who's the subject there? The Jews built. Okay. So how does this formal explain that? He says, Vehim Kiblu Alehim Lamas, Livnos Esharin. They accepted upon themselves as a tax to build the cities. Okay. So the way it worked was the Egyptians basically just said, okay, you guys have to pay taxes. And the Jews said, oh, instead of paying, we'll work it off. And they just voluntarily put themselves into this slave labor, uh, or not slave labor, it wasn't slave labor yet, but it was labor, uh, hard labor, in order to pay the taxes. And that's what leads to this other thing, okay, which is, uh, hold on, I'm going to complete the picture first. Um, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, and the more they um, spread out. And they became disgusted because of B'nai Israel. And Egypt enslaved B'nai Israel with backbreaking work. So what does that mean? When the Egyptians saw the Jews degrading themselves with this inferior work, then they made them into slaves. And this is because the more the Jews added to their own sin upon their own sin, then their decision-making ability became corrupted. And they went into worse and worse situations. Um, and let's just, uh, so, so what he's saying is, uh, I want to summarize this and then do that last passage and then we'll be done with the Pesukim here. So Egypt says, okay, you guys pay taxes, okay? And you can do that, right? But then secretly the Egyptians are like, okay, they're going to leave. And they just say, oh, taxes? We would rather do menial labor than pay the taxes. So we'll do menial labor. So they just did it. And that caught the Egyptians out uh, off guard. And then they realized, oh, these people are going to do labor. Well, if they're going to degrade themselves to do labor, we might as well take advantage of cheap labor, okay, that we can get them to do this. And then they started gradually enslaving them. And the Jews, the more they were involved in hate, he says, then the more they made bad decisions and they eventually became totally enslaved. And then the final step is They embittered their lives with hard work, with mortar and bricks, with all their work in the field and all the work that they worked on was with backbreaking labor. So Sforno says, The more the Jews increased their sinning in their beliefs and in their actions, as the Navi says, and he quotes that long passage in the Chazgal about how they didn't get rid of their idols, then the hand of their oppressors got worse and worse. Okay, so this was, again, the Jews, um, he's saying it was the Jews' fault, and that answers Yael's question, which is, at this point, Egyptians no longer wanted to drive them out of the land. Now they had a, a willing working slave population that was uh, was serving Egypt, and now they want to keep them as slaves. And then by the time you get to like, uh, you know, uh, later on, then then they definitely want to keep them as slaves. Um, let me just see if there's anything here. Uh, yeah, similarly, the form of student says, Amr Hagaon, the genius says, the more evil the Jews became, then the Gezeros of Paro got worse and worse. But first they put tax masters, uh, tax officers on them. 
And I decided not to go into the whole uh, genocide campaign because uh, that's a whole different topic, but it, it was a result of this. And b- b- um, before I call on you, I just want to point out before I forget, this is entirely consistent with, with halacha because according to halacha, if something bad is happening to the Jewish community, what does that mean? What should that indicate? They're sinning. That we're sinning, right? And this is open halacha, right? This is this is an actual mitzvah del raisa in Hilgos Tanios that the Ramam says that v'davar zeh midarchet tshuvahu. This is one of the ways of tshuva. Shibizman shetavu tsarav yizaku lavi yariu. When a, a tsara a, a calamity befalls the Jewish people and they cry out in tefillah and they sound the trumpets, yedu akol, everyone will know shibiglal masim harayim hurlehem. That it was because of their evil actions that this happened to them. Kakasu avonosechem hitu ele. This will cause them to remove the tsara. If they don't cry out and sound the trumpets, but they say this is just the way of the world, right? There are evil kings; they enslave people. But tsaras on nikra This is just a happenstance thing. This is a way of, of indifference. And that will cause them to cling to their evil actions. And that will increase the tsara and other tsaros. So in other words, according to the premises of Hashgacha, the way I understand it, you know, this, and this goes in line with what Sforno said, that God doesn't do injustice, that this is all their fault. And the worse they get, and the more they don't turn to tshuva and reject their vodazara, the worse it's going to get. You know, that's like the Ram quotes in the the, the Tokaha here. If you walk with me with chance, I will walk with you with the fury of chance. If I bring a tsar upon you so that you do tshuva, im if you say that it's just chance, I'll just increase the, the anger of that chance. Okay, that's the end of the Sforno's narrative on the Exodus. We have one more thing after this, which is the Brisbane and Basarium, and then we'll put it all together. But yeah, uh, Ayala, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, so just to clarify, what exactly did the Egyptians not like about the Jews in the beginning that they wanted them to leave? Right, so it seemed like the concern, the way the Sforno understands it, is that because the Jews were already different culturally from the, uh, than the, from the Egyptians, because they had Mila and they had different language and they lived in a different place. And they also uh, you know, had different uh, uh, customs, you know, they were shepherds, right? All that stuff. So then if there is a war, then the Jews are gonna join with the enemy uh, and not with uh, the Egyptians. And the way that the Rabbi Palkovitz uh, describes it is he said, um, or maybe I'm imagining this, uh, hold on. Yeah, yeah, he says, um, the original intention of the Egyptians was not to enslave the Hebrews, but to make conditions unbearable for them, thereby compelling them to leave voluntarily. The Egyptians were sensitive to the opinion of the other nations, hence they attempted in devious ways to rid themselves of this potential fifth column, for they were convinced that a people so alien and strange as the Jews would certainly be disloyal in a time of national crisis. And that's the concept of the, uh, of the fifth column in general. Uh, that's the expression, fifth column, column. A group within a country at war who are sympathetic to or working for the enemies uh, that um, uh, I think fifth column is usually also people who are like foreign populations that are in, amid the main population because they won't identify with the main population. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Lauren. I guess, could you also summarize like all his? I mean, maybe it's too much, but like where he gets that the Jews sin from, is it from like not listing the names? Okay, yeah, um, so, so let, let's, let's just do a quick review here, okay? So um, I'm just going to find the, the list of Pesukim here. Okay, so um, these are the names of the children of Israel who came down to the Mitzrayim. So this shows that these were the only people who were worthy of being mentioned by name. And this is a theory that the Swarm has throughout Torah, that whenever it uses the phrase calling someone by name, it means that they made themselves worthy. So it means these were the only worthy people. Okay. Um, then Yosef died and all his brothers in that entire generation. He learns that that passage shows you that um, they did not, the Egyptians did not enslave the Jews until the whole generation died. Because even the offspring of Yaakov who were not named were still tzaddikim, but they just weren't luminaries that influenced the whole generation. 
Okay. Then the children of Israel were fruitful and swarmed, multiplied, and grew very, very mighty. So the implication of swarming is they acted like insects and they were fruitful, uh, like insects, meaning that they did it, they bred in a, uh, in a, um, you know, kind of a degraded way. But this is where Sworno is taking in information from Ksuvim and Nevim and Ksuvim, that you have Tehillim saying that the Jews in Mitzrayim uh, sinned. Uh, that was the Tehillim 20, uh, 105. Um, that, uh, uh, oh yeah, sorry, he got it from the fact that, they, that Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. He came, Israel came to Egypt, which was the, you know, worthy population. And then Yaakov, Sojourn and Land of Ham, those are all allusions to, uh, to badness. Um, and, uh, and then the big thing is Yechezkel, that it says explicitly that they were so involved in Avodah Zarah that God almost destroyed them. Okay, so Sworno is definitely relying on that as well. Um, then a new king rose over Egypt who did not know Yosef because Yosef was so exalted and these people were so degraded that he couldn't think about the fact, he couldn't conceive of the fact that these people had any relationship to Yosef and he didn't see any need to like, you know, have a car to Yosef by protecting these people because these people are completely like disaffiliated. Um, and oh, also the fact that a new king arose meant that, uh, that that's a sign that the Hashgacha was no longer with them. And then the Egyptians said, okay, we're going to uh, try to get these people to leave. And they set taxes upon them to try to incentivize them to leave. But then the Jews, um, the Jews decided to build storage cities to pay off the taxes. So now they're volunteering themselves for menial labor. And then the Egyptians were like, oh, fine, you want to labor? Then, then labor. And they kept on degrading themselves more and more and more and get, becoming more and more enslaved and multiplying, which made the Egyptians even more disgusted. And then finally they... Uh, they just totally like overtook them and oppressed them because they were, uh, you know, they were cheap slave labor. And just like any other slaves in the ancient world, you know, you mistreat them because you don't treat them as human. Jews got degraded themselves to that point. And the thing that allowed the Jews to get to that point was they kept sinning. So it got worse. And the more they sinned, then the more corrupt their own etza was, their own decision making abilities were. So they made it worse for themselves. Yeah, Tamar. Um, I. I don't know, this might be too off topic, I guess, but I yeah. kind of think it's interesting. I wonder if there's like a lesson that we can learn from the mistake of, I guess there's a lot of the different mistakes that they made. It might be interesting to think about in the specifics, but I was just thinking about the mistake of um, offering to do menial labor to pay off the taxes. Yeah. Like yeah. apparently that was a bad idea. I think it was an right. interesting yeah, thing. Be, yeah, that, that, that is a good, uh, a good thing. And by the way, I believe the Ramban has a similar theory and where he explains uh, how the, degradation of the slavery went in stages, but I, I, I don't remember offhand. Yeah, that, that's a good, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to take it up now, but it's a good question to think about. Okay, but now there's one question that we did not address, which is the first mention of this, the Brisbane and Basarim, and I want to go over that, those three psukim, and then uh, I want to conclude with a, a theory about uh, what could have happened if they didn't do this, okay? So Brisbane and Basarim, okay, Yadoa Teda, you shall surely know that your offspring will be a stranger in a land that's not theirs. And they will serve them. And they will afflict them for 400 years. So you got this big sforno here. So he told Avraham the cause of the delay of his children inheriting the land. Now pause for a second, okay? If you're Avraham, you've heard this promise a couple of times already from God that I'm going to give you uh, the, the land of Egypt, uh, the land of, uh, of Israel, right? But he, he now tells him that his offspring are, are going to inherit it. So Avram is going to wonder, well, why, why my offspring? Like, why not, you know, why not me or like my son? So the reason is Kilo Shalim Avon HaEmori, because the sin of the Emorites is not yet complete. Okay, so what does that mean? Now, the Emorites were the, the barbarian nation in uh, one of the, you know, the, the reference to the Shiva Amin and the, the barbarian nations in Canaan. Okay, so this is an amazing statement. Kilo yitzdak lagarish goy me arzo It is not righteous for um, to exile a people from their land until their measure of wrath is filled. Okay, now, um, uh, I, I don't know anything about um, Israeli history and politics. Okay. But I do know that there are people who just say like, we just got to kick out all of the Arabs. Okay. Right. 
Um, and, uh, and the Sforno and not just Sforno, I think the Ramban also learns it this way, that, that even though the Avos were promised that their offspring will inherit the land. Okay. It would be, it, and even though the Emirates were horrible people, okay, there is a certain point where those people don't deserve to be kicked out of their land yet. And God is going to wait until they get so bad that they deserve to be kicked out. Okay. So he says, Amar Imkain, Yadoateda. So you, oh, so now the question is, so this poses, poses a logistic problem, okay, which is God says, I'm going to give your offspring the land, but the Emirates are uh, sin is not going to be complete until the fourth generation. So now what's the logistics problem about Avram's offspring? The land is like, where are they going to be? Other yeah, where are they going to be, right? Where are they going to be, okay? So, so that's where this comes in. He says like this. You should certainly know. Even though I swore to give the land to your offspring, it's not going to be immediately. Because your offspring will be a stranger in land in a land not theirs. They have to be a stranger in a land not theirs until the Emory sin is complete. The Imzen with this, he told him the event of the subjugation by Inui and the affliction that will happen in the future to some of his offspring. Because indeed, this did not happen in the generations of the Tzadikim. As long as one of the Shvatim was alive, uh, one of the 12 sons, then the subjugation did not start. So here again, you see, not Yochavet and Amram. Right, specifically the twelve sons of Yaakov. Oh, I just read that. It happened to them when they perverted their way. Okay, and then he quotes those psukim in, in Yechezkel again. Okay, that they worshipped the Vodazar and God almost destroyed them. Okay, now why did he tell Avram this? Okay, so again. This is not the way that we normally learn it, that he was decreeing on the offspring here. He's informing Abraham that this is going to happen. Okay, why did he tell him this? <laughs> now, this is this is going to make you even sadder, I think. <laughs> he told Abraham this so that the last generation would know the Kabbalah through tradition, that this is God's word. And they would not ascribe the matter to someone else, okay? Um, oh, I forgot to bring. Uh, wait, did I include the, no, I didn't include the translation here. Hold on. I want to make sure I translate this right. Uh, I got to get my Tanea. <laughs> This is, this is, I find this to be very sad. Okay. 45, uh, 8, 45, uh, sorry, 48, 5 says, I told you beforehand, and when it had not yet happened, I informed you, lest you say, my deity accomplished them, my graven image and my molten idol have ordained them. Okay. So what is he saying? If God didn't tell this to Abraham, then what would have happened? Yeah, Vanessa? Is he saying, like, we would have reached such a low point that, like, we wouldn't have even been able to recognize, like, oh, this is God's hand, and, like, we would have gotten to such a point of idolatry that we would have had to been destroyed, let alone, like, enslaved? And and and, and who would they have blamed the slavery on? Like, some non-God entity. Yeah. The, they, they were, like... The, the, the idols that they worshipped. In other words, the Jews would have said... So, so he's telling this to Avram so that he passes it down, so they have a Masora that this is going to be part of God's plan. And, and so that if this didn't happen, then the Jews of Mitzrayim would say, oh, we're enslaved because the Egyptian God Re, Ra is punishing us. You know, they would have been so far gone in their Vodazara. So he had to give them this fact that like, that there's someone in the nation who's going to preserve it. And by the way, who did preserve this um, in the nation? And how do you know? Who preserved the Masora that this is from... Uh, God and 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 how do you know from the from the Chumash that that this was preserved? 
Is this the Picard Picardi thing? Uh, that is the language. No, wait, no. Language. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think so. Yeah, Ayala? It says they cried out to Hashem. Okay, so the Tzadikim, uh, again, yeah, from the Talim Shira, which we also, the Sforno and the Talim Shira really complements this, right? Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, they did cry out to Hashem. That's true. I think you know it from the Pesukim, though, from the fact that Moshe asks, what name should I tell them? And that they'll know that I was that that you sent me. So evidently, there were people in Mitzrayim, and this is the Zakanim, probably a lot of the Levim, who had a, a Masora that God would redeem them, you know. Um, and and then that's why Moshe asked that question. Because if these people had not heard of anything about God redeeming them, then they just wouldn't listen to Moshe. You know, they wouldn't matter. Yeah, Ayala. So if these people are going to be so bad, I mean us, I guess, or B'nai Israel and Mitzrayim, we're going to be so bad. Yeah. Then. Why did Hashem want like tell us to Avraham in order that they can be like restored, kind of, and taken so that's on the God thing. In the Torah? So, so Swarno doesn't say this, but the secondary purpose, of the the purpose of telling a bad nevua, always is that there's hope that they could do tshuva, and we know that if you do tshuva, then the bad nevua can be overturned. So telling him this was also an opportunity to 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 get the the uh, to prevent it from happening. You know, so I think that that was part of the plan. Yeah, it just didn't happen. Okay, then he has one good deal. Okay, one good inference. I had read this many times. Okay, but um, I never really paid attention to it. Wait, sorry. Uh, yeah, sure. Let's ask the clarification. So yeah. that last part when Moshe when Moshe said what name I should tell them that was because they they had an expectation that they would that Hashem was going to like put them in slavery, or that's just because they had some you know, heritage of their being. So it's, it's, the way Swarm says it is the, the last generation would know through tradition that this is happening because of the Dvar Hashem and they would not ascribe it to a Zara. So if they didn't have this, then they would have blamed their slavery on a Zara. Okay. But so, okay. So like they, they knew then this Nebuah to Abraham. I yes. Guess. Yeah. Right. Now, again, when I say they, when you say they, I mean, I don't know if the average person knew it, but it was kept alive in the nation through Shavit Levy, at least. Yeah. Okay, now, I've read this so many times, but I never paid attention. V'gam es ha'goy asher yavodu dananofi. But also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Now, we talk all the time about how God punished the Egyptians, but what does gam imply? Who's gam coming to include? The Jews. The Jews, Okay. And just as I, this is God talking to Avram, just as I will judge your children, your son, your offspring for their wickedness in affliction and punishment and, and slavery, I will also punish the nation, judge the nation that they, uh, that subjugates them. Okay. So I, I always read this passage as the main point is, oh, I'm going to punish the Egyptians, but really the main thing is, oh yeah, of course I'm going to punish your offspring. But in addition, I will punish the Egyptians because I, I the Sforo doesn't say this, but the Ramam, you know, you know, Ramam asked the question in Shimon Prakim in, in the eighth chapter, uh, if if uh, if God decreed this, then how is it fair for him to punish the Egyptians? You know, so you know, there's different answers given. Um, uh, one answer is that he didn't decree on any particular Egyptian to punish, to to enslave or afflict, but also they went beyond. Uh, you know, beyond the norm in affliction, afflicting the Jews. Yeah. Yeah, Ella? I thought the Gom was like, not only will you be redeemed from there, but also the nation. I think that's, that might be how I thought of it also. Yeah, yeah. But Sforno was learning it, that not only will you be punished, uh, you know, you're also going to be punished, but these Egyptians will also. Okay. Um, I, I'm skimming this. Uh... Yeah, so he makes the same point. He says, um, uh, I'll just read it. Yeah, so basically, he's saying that, uh, he told him that it's only going to come about when the avon of the emory is complete. That's what divine justice dictates. God will not do uh, injustice to any creature. Okay, fine. Um, okay, I'm just skimming this. Okay, fine. 
okay fine uh yeah okay right okay so uh so that is the brisim of Asarim. so again in the brisim of Asarim, god is not decreeing this on the jews he's informing avram that because god knows the future and knows that these jews are going to go bad then this is going to happen and he's telling avram this so that avram could pass down the masora that this is happening by devar hashem so that they don't make an additional mistake of attributing it to avodah zara and also to give them uh the out of doing tshuva if they know that this is going to happen okay now one question remains which is this is the jews making bad decisions what could it have looked like if it was uh, good okay so for this um this is from my PowerPoint from the uh, the high school thing. So I don't know how many of you have seen the Back to the Future trilogy, one of the best trilogies ever. But there's a scene in Back to the Future 2 where Doc um, explains what happens where there's a timeline that's skewed in a, into an alternate dimension and uh, and set off an alternate timeline. OK, so I have that imagery there. Um, so um, so this is uh, this is my understanding of of what could have happened. Now, this is not based on the Sforna, okay? This is largely based on a series of shirim that Rabbi David Foreman gave on Aleph Beta. And he wrote a book called um, The Exodus You Almost Passed Over, okay? It's a, a good book. Uh, it's almost like reading a shir, but like being in a shir experience. It's, it's, if you're looking for a good English book to get, to like read, not, you know, there's so many English books that are like individual divrei Torah or individual commentary, but you know, like, there's a certain book, you know, sometimes you want like a, a whole like odyssey. This is a good book to read. Okay. Um, so I got it from there. Okay. So I just don't remember which parts were my ideas and which parts were his. So again, this is the summary. Coined to Sforno, the slavery and the suffering in Mitzrayim was not necessary for B'day Israel's development and could have been avoided. So this is the timeline. Okay. So this is what should have happened. Okay. Brisbane of Asarim. Okay. Green means good. Okay. Then Yaakov and his sons go down to Mitzrayim. And why they're going down to Mitzrayim? Food. Okay, that was the cause of bringing them down, but why couldn't they just go into Eretz Israel or stay in Eretz Israel? Because the other nations were because the going. other nations are there, and then there was also a practical thing, which is that they did need to multiply and become a nation, right? Because you only have the 70 souls. So you need a place where they can go, where they can multiply and become a nation that is not Eretz Israel, because Eretz Israel is not ready yet, because the Avon Hemory is not complete. Okay, so what would have happened is they go down to Mitzrayim, become a nation in Mitzrayim, and are not enslaved or afflicted, okay, and then they, they have a Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim and go into Eretz Yisrael, okay? But what happened is the timeline skewed into an alternate uh, timeline, and Mitzrayim enslaves and afflicts B'nai Israel, okay, and then you have an, another Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim that was very different than what it could have been, and what was the turning point? According to Sforno, it was instead of following the Derech Hashem, they assimilated into Mitzrayim and worshipped the Vodazara. Okay, now this is, so this was all implicit in the Sforno, okay? But here's the part that I got um, from, in part from Rabbi David Foreman and in part from my own ideas, okay? So here's what actually happened. Yaakov and his sons go down to Mitzrayim. They are treated as royalty and they are admired by Mitzrayim, right? So Yaakov, Yosef actually is promoted to like second in command. And if you read the Pesukim and Breshis, then Yaakov Avinu gets a royal funeral, okay, with an entourage from Paro with his chariots. And Rabbi Foreman makes a whole thing about how, like, they um, uh, they escort him. Actually, I just want to read the Lashon. Okay, when Yaakov has his funeral, this is like the, the end part of uh, Breshis that we don't really pay much attention to. Um, he says, yeah. So it says, um, so Yosef went up to bury his father and with him went up all of Paro's servants, the elders of his household and all the elders of the land of Egypt. Okay, and all of Yosef's household, the brothers and the father's household, only their young children, their flocks and their cow that they leave in, God, in, in the region of Goshen. Um, and he brought them up with both chariots and horsemen. The camp was very imposing. They came to Goran Ha'atad, which is across the Yarden, and they held a very great and imposing eulogy. Okay, which by the way, if you know Eretz Yisrael geography, if you're going from Egypt, what's weird about, about going across the Yarden?
So Egypt is in the west. I'm, and, I'm not good at geography. Do you have to go and come back? Yeah. So you, you go the whole long route all the way around and then come in from the east. So this was not just a practical trip. This was a like a funeral procession. Like kind of reminds me of um, when Lincoln died. They had a whole thing where Lincoln's uh, coffin was on this train that they went through like all these American cities and people like went and gathered and paid their respects. So it's like a huge thing. Okay, not only that, when the Canaanite inhabitants of the land saw the Goran, morning in Goran Hatad, they said, Evil Kavid Zele Mitzrayim. This is a grievous morning for Mitzrayim. Therefore, it was named Avil Mitzrayim, which is across the Arden. So in other words, like this was such a big entourage of, of, uh, of, of uh, Egyptian royalty that the Canaanites thought that this was a royal Egyptian death. Okay, so huge, huge royalty. And Paro respected Yosef, and this was great. Okay, so what, what actually happened? So after the first generation died, though, Bnei Israel started assimilating and worshiping of Odazara. They multiply and grow into a nation. Mitzrayim feels threatened, and then they tax Bnei Israel to compel them to leave the country. Instead, Bnei Israel volunteer to pay off the taxes through slave labor. They are enslaved. Mitzrayim oppresses them, and they assimilate further. And then Hashem saves Bnei Israel, and then all but destroys Mitzrayim, okay? So that's what actually happened. Now, here's my theory about what could have happened, okay? And this is going to make you sad, because this would have been great if it could have happened, okay? Step one, Yaakov and his sons go down to Mitzrayim and are treated as royalty and admired by Mitzrayim. After the first generation dies, Bnei Israel still follow the Derech Hashem and do not assimilate. Okay? Bnei Israel multiply and grow into a nation. Mitzrayim is inspired by Bnei Israel, and Bnei Israel teach them the Derech Hashem. Okay? And remember, Mitzrayim is the world's greatest superpower at the time. Okay? And the greatest technology. Okay? Then Bnei Israel, a new nation, and Mitzrayim, a world superpower, become closer and closer to Hashem while they're growing and while the Emorim are getting bad, worse. Then Paro and Mitzrayim accept Hashem as their God, and they spread his name throughout the world with, with um, Mitzrayim being the, the pinnacle of Bnei Noach and Jews being the pinnacle of Bnei Israel and working together. And then Bnei Israel is redeemed and Mitzrayim is transformed. And there's Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim that is as glorious and great as the Yitzhiya of Yaakov's uh, 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 procession. And there's no no plagues necessary and maybe there are miracles necessary to like you know teach people about hashem but there's no destruction of its rhyme and everything is 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 great you know so that's really how it could have gone down if uh if if we did not worship a Zara. okay and that's the uh that's the sad the sad story that that could have been uh or the sad story uh that replaces the story that could have been yeah ayala i feel like it's interesting now what we said in the beginning about how um loya das yosef yeah so like that he didn't uh, relate the Bnei Israel to Yosef because if he would have, then like Yosef right. was looked at as this like great Chacham who was right. like really smart and transformed Egypt. So if they saw this nation, which was also smart and great and whatever, then right. like they would have respected them. That's already. a good point. And he would have said like, okay, like anything that was good about Yosef, it died with Yosef, you know, like, oh, there's actually a, uh, there's a weird Raya. Um, but um, when, <laughs> okay. Uh, when, Nebuchadnezzar made everyone bow down to his statue. Then uh, Hananiah, Misha, and Azari refused to bow down. And then Nebuchadnezzar had them thrown into the fiery furnace. And then the miracle was done and they didn't get burned. And, uh, and Nebuchadnezzar then goes and says, praise be the God of Hananiah, Misha, and Azariah. Okay. Uh, and there are Mepharshim who say that, that if the Jews had refused to bow down, then and then he still would have thrown in Hananiah, Misha, and Azariah because they were the representatives. And then he would have said, Praise be the God of Israel. But he viewed it as just a phenomenon of Hanani Michel Nazaria. So same thing here. I'm sure this Paro still admired Yosef, but it's like, okay, that's Yosef's thing. And everything died with Yosef. And these guys over here, they're not, they're not, you know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, it's like I've heard uh, Rebbe say that like, um, you know, what was, the, you know, that the, uh, uh, the Greek philosophers, you know, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle had a lot of ideas that were great and that they were, um, uh, you know that they were main and were in line with the with the Torah, but you look at the Greeks now and they're like they're animals, you know. And the, he said, the, you know, the, the the problem was the Greeks didn't have a system of halakha to pass it on. But that's the thing is the Greeks now have nothing to do with Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. You know, like they're just totally gone. You know, like that this. If you ever heard Johnny tell the story when he went to Greece and he went to like the uh, the to Plato's academy, it's just like a a, a city park 
that has like a plaque that says like Plato's Academy was here. Like it's not even like a museum, you know, it's just like they're so far removed that there's just no interest in even. And I think he said like all the information that they had, uh, you know, for Plato's Academy was like historically like who Plato was nothing about ideas or anything like that. Like it's just like complete disconnect. And that's kind of how it was with uh, Yosef and his, uh, you know, and the Jews. Yeah. Lauren. Um, do you know how like the giving of the yep. Torah fits in with like what yeah. could have happened? Like did um was question, still getting the Torah getting I, I don't know. I don't know. Fun to think about though. Yeah. And by the way, this thing also it's, it's speculation, but I think it's reasonable to assume that this is this is what let's put it this way. I don't know that this is what would have happened, but it seems totally plausible and it seems in line with the plan of Am Yisrael right now is to inspire the other nations and to get everyone to serve God, not as Jews, but, you know, uh, you know, that, that's the, uh, oh, let's tie it into, let's tie it into the Pesach Seder. Okay. Uh, really quickly. Uh,